Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. This is our mission spotlight over here at the Red Wire booth. My name is Camille Bergen. Um, I am so excited to be your host for all of the tech talks and mission spotlights here at the Red Wire booth this week. Um, I'm a science communicator, and you might know me as Galactic Gal. So without further ado, we're going to hand it over to our speakers here. So we have Dean Bellamy, uh, the executive vice president. I'm going to try not to look at my notes, but I'm going to look at my notes of a national security space at Red Wire. And Spence Wise, the Senior Vice President of Missions and Platforms, also at Redwire. And you guys are about to talk to us about VLEO, Very Low Earth Orbit, and your new SaberSat mission design. So I'll hand it over to you. Hey, thank you so much. Oh, well, uh, I guess you don't need that. Hey, is it not amazing to have Camille here? How about a round of applause for Camille? Uh, one, hey, we're going to be talking about this. Uh, if you, uh, uh, thanks to our amazing Marcom team, you'll see uh, a lot of information on our website. If you're interested, please find Omar or Terry, who I just saw around right here, if you have any questions. And, uh, you know, Spence, it's a pleasure to be on stage with you. We have another colleague I also want to talk about, and that's Juan over there. Juan, if you raise your hand. We're also doing a lot of Leo over in our uh, Luxembourg office. And so, you know, Juan, if you get a chance, please uh, have a chance to tell people about the amazing things we're doing with SkimSat, okay? Awesome. All right, so Spence, a lot of people in the audience, we got a great crowd. The first thing we have to ask is, what is VLEO? We have to describe it. What, is, what are we talking about? Yeah, a very good foundational question. So very low Earth orbit is lower than low Earth orbit, LEO. So typically it runs from about 90 kilometers up to 350 kilometers, kind of skimming through the lower part of the thermosphere. Absolutely. So in Rala, it's below the ISS, right? So what we're looking at is below the ISS. Yeah. All right. So a lot of people may be asking, let's talk about some of the strategic advantages. Why VLEO? Why would you want to operate there? What are the advantages of putting a satellite there? Oh, yeah. So first and foremost, proximity, being closer to anything that you're trying to take a picture of or to receive a signal from, uh, all made easier uh, by being closer. And that's getting over the tyranny of free space loss, if you will. Uh, Absolutely. Complementary to other orbits like LEO, MEO, GEO uh, as well, correct? That's right. And closing the network from the multiple orbits is an important uh, element of that. Something we've been thinking through uh, hard uh, so that we can uh, get those constellations to work together. Uh, another attribute would be resiliency, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that's probably one I get most excited about. You, know, you hear a lot of conversation about uh, orbital debris, pieces and parts of old satellites that are up there in low Earth orbit or above, those might last for decades. Uh, the unique feature of very low Earth orbit is that there's just enough atomic oxygen up there to create drag. And even higher than us, the uh, International Space Station itself has to regularly reboost to offset some of the drag it runs to uh, at its higher altitude. So that drag actually creates a natural feature to pull uh, debris out of the orbit. And instead of it being around for decades, uh, as it does in LEO, it might only be around for days or weeks. So a very, very um, advantaged orbit in regard to debris. Absolutely. And when I think of uh, from a uh, maybe military DOD, uh, maybe IC perspective, you know, you're above where uh, UAVs or drones would fly, how to do drones, and you're lower than where satellites typically could operate. So sounds like there's a lot of advantages in that, that region. Um, one other, another one that we could talk about is uh, mobility. So people may, we're going to talk SaberSat in a minute. They may ask, uh, what are you using, for example, for mobility on a VLEO platform? Yeah, so uh, we look at uh, electric thrusters, and there's a an emerging market of uh, multiple uh, thruster technologies that can solve uh, the necessary thrust to offset the drag. Uh, so we, we are working closely with a few teams on some very novel uh, approaches to that, uh, key to in fact enabling VLEO. Uh, and we're also uh, incorporating air breathing elements into our satellites uh, optionally. So depending on the duration of the mission, we actually have the ability to scoop atomic oxygen and fractions of nitrogen and utilize those in our electric thrusters. Uh, and of course, that's not a perpetual motion machine because you have to put a lot of energy into it. And that's where solar comes into a big play that. 
That sounds really fascinating. So let's talk, let's introduce SaberSat, should we? Yeah. All right. Let's click over. I gotta see if this will come up here. All right, let's do it. All right, so what is SaberSat? Let's talk about it. All right, so SaberSat is an, an ex, uh, exquisite ISR platform uh, intended for uh, US uh, and, uh, DoD customers. Uh, here you can see uh, one configuration. There's a great flexibility in uh, the system, both in the total length of the system. It actually uses modular bulkheads, allows us to extend the unit if we need, say, more power collection capability. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, flying through drag, uh, you want to be shaped much like a long dart. And so if we go look at this from a head-on perspective, you can see this is a very unusual satellite in that it is aerodynamic. We can add, uh, again, elements in length without extending the cross section of that vehicle. Uh, and that's an efficient way to add much more power uh, or in the case of uh, planar arrays, uh, uh, ESAs uh, or scanning arrays, uh, we can add a substantial length to those, which increases aperture and gain and performance of the exquisite payload. So I, I make one more key point to this is that there are uh, other satellites you'll hear about in VLEO that are typically looking at how do I make the smallest thing that I can make to go up there? This is on the other end. We're intending to bring real exquisite capabilities uh, for the DoD and our allies down to a new regime that can drive a very substantial increase in performance. Yeah, and so we're calling this new breed of satellite, right? Uh, uh, and it's really a high fidelity concept, as you see on the screen there, an orbital drone, right? And that's uh, what we're calling this new breed of satellite. And its performance, its endurance and cost is something you'll hear us talking about, not only here, but we'll also be talking about it in a lot of details on our website uh, that our amazing Marcom team has put out there. So you'll see that as well. All right, so let's talk SaberSat and uh, what makes it unique, Spence? So what's, what really makes it stand out? Yeah, thanks. So, so the, once again, the, the aerodynamic design of the satellite is a real big enabler. You can see here on the back with kind of the current configuration with two uh, electric thrusters. So this could be a Hall Effect thrusters, uh, which are commercially available products. As I mentioned, there are developments going on to add new, more efficient uh, capabilities that we are uh, very interested in as well. Uh, what's not shown here uh, is a payload, for example. And the payload is highly dependent on the mission configuration. So uh, nominally, you would have uh, the, this belly here has uh, volume available. Uh, where a semi-extended pod can be put on there. You can imagine it'll look like a little bump. Uh, and that bump would give us the ability to have cameras, IR systems, uh, or even if you wanted to use the full uh, length of the satellite as a planar array uh, for radar or other signal uh, type operations. So it's a modular design. Uh, all right, so we have to say, where did the name come from? We got to tell people, because I know somebody in the audience is going to ask, right? How did you name it? How did you name your new breed of satellite, right? That everybody is seeing on the screen and here on your iPad. Yeah, I feel like it's like one of those good songs like where you're, the artist is not supposed to tell you what it means. Uh, <laughs> to keep the mystery going. But uh, some, will, some will say it's like a saber tooth tiger. Uh, what, what actually started was when we looked at the front of the satellite here and looked at uh, particularly air breathing capabilities, you needed a, a, a substantial scoop on the front of the satellite. And it looked like the classic Sabre jet uh, for those of your Air Force. The F-886? Yes, Sabre set, absolutely. And what you were talking about, the modular design, similar to an aircraft where you would have, uh, if folks who are familiar with aircraft, you'd have pods and people can build the pods. You're saying the same thing for payloads, whether it be an ISR payload or scientific payload, right? Doing research or atmospheric research. You can design those uh, specific payloads just like an aircraft. That's right. That's right. And then we also have a great flexibility with the solar panels here. They're shown in a vertical configuration. That's very advantage for a sun sink orbit, uh, which is this configuration here. Uh, if we're looking for a diversified orbit set or full constellation, you do have the option to move those to the sides of the spacecraft. They look more like wings. Um, that is one of the things that uh, Redwire brings to the table here, this full mission design. Uh, we do use our digital environment uh, to optimize these platforms to the actual mission operation. Uh, and we're working on several applications like that right now for the uh, U.S. government. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I know you talked about air breathing. Let's talk about the value of that. So the value proposition of that. Um, 
I will throw an analogy up and we'll just kind of play it by ear. So many of you have heard probably General Shaw talk about how you have an RV in space if it, uh, but without a fuel tank or gas station to refuel it. So the nice thing here in a clean orbit, you have the ability to maybe do some self-fueling. Oh yeah, entirely. In fact, uh, we've looked at uh, several orbital regimes or several altitudes uh, that there's a very nice wide window in which we can collect more atomic oxygen and nitrogen than we would actually expel, uh, which means that in theory, you can entirely maneuver without regret, uh, uh, make various maneuvers, orbit change, and so forth. Now, I would stress it's electric thrusters, so you got to put a little bit of time into it, but it is a very unique capability. Absolutely. Very unique capability. All right. So let's have fun. All right, Juan, we're going to bring you in and we're going to talk uh, a little bit about other experiences in here. So Camille may have a mic. We're going to grab the mic. Hey, so Juan, let's talk about, we're talking about SaberSat and we're going to also talk about what's next for SkimSat. Can you tell everybody a little bit about SkinSat and what you're doing? Right. So can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, so we're we're currently working on the design phase for our Vileo platform, also in the European front. Uh, this platform is intended to fly a bit above what uh, SaberSat is targeting now. Uh, we are not looking to, to use the, the air breathing capability just yet, um, but it is something that we can implement down the line. Uh, we're focusing on, on operational capability and sustaining operations in Vileo as long as possible. Uh, we're working with, together with our partners to, to move that into the implementation phase in the short term. Yes. That's fantastic. So, uh, you know, just to point out with Redwire Europe and then what we're doing here in Redwire US, you know, to have uh, two really efforts focused on VLEO, really, uh, you know, the expertise we're going to be bringing from our European side as well as our US side, really, uh, I think, gives a lot of uh, credibility, but also it gives us a, a, a lot of significant advantages here at Redwire. So Spence, why don't you talk a little bit about SaberSat and this design? Yeah, it's been exciting. We've been working on this for roughly a year, building on the experience uh, that Juan brings from the uh, European front on Vileo. So very excited to be bringing that to bear. Um, I was hoping we could share some exciting news here. We can't say anything about it we yet. We can't say anything that, yeah. But keep an eye on our website and uh, in our press releases, uh, we should have some more uh, news coming forward. Absolutely. And hey, look, if you're uh, for our European and allied colleagues, uh, Juan, where can they find out information about say, uh, SkimSat? And they want to hear more about that. Uh, they can reach out to me. Absolutely. Dean Bellamy, you can reach out to me. You can reach out to our Marcom team. There'll be information on uh, SkimSat on our website, as well as we'll have information available. Uh, but it's really exciting to see uh, not only the, the brand new collaboration and, uh, and uh, SaberSat that we're bringing out, but really uh, the leveraging across both uh, SaberSat and SkimSat and what we're doing there. Um, all right. So I know there's some questions and I know some people may want questions. So I'm going to ask Camille if she doesn't mind our galactic gal. If she cannot, uh, maybe let's see any questions from the audience about SaberSat or what uh, what Spence and myself and Juan were talking about. Any questions from anyone? All right, let's go. How important are aerodynamics for VLEO vehicles? Oh, great question. All right, so Spence, aerodynamics is huge. Modeling of those aerodynamics, the, uh, the drag, the atomic oxygen. Let's talk about the amazing modeling and sim capabilities at Redwire, supporting both not only here, but also our European colleagues. Yeah, utilizing our Acorn uh, digital engineering environment, uh, we created a plugin that allows us to uh, actually uh, model the drag of sparse gas as you travel through the thermosphere. And that is actually the first and driving factor in every mission we go and architect uh, through that Acorn system for VLEO, because it is a huge factor. Essentially, it's trying to pull you out of the sky. So you have to design around that. Yeah, it really is. It's a phenomenal question, by the way, to ask that, because that is a challenge, right? This is one of the challenges you will face on the materials you're choosing and also on, on some of the like con ops or your operational concept of how you're going to fly something. And so that's really a tribute, too, to the amazing engineers that we have here at Redwire that are doing amazing work. We've got some amazing uh, folks on the material side in our office in Jacksonville, as well as uh, several other offices. And so we're able to leverage that, as well as our folks out of Luxembourg and Belgium. Uh, and our Belgium contingency have a tremendous amount of heritage 
Uh, for folks who didn't see on the on the Belgium side, I'm going to give a shout out to, to Juan and to Eric back there. They just had a Proba three day uh, with uh, with ES ESA and it went phenomenal and it was a great partnership and uh, and really just went amazing and really just uh, we're so proud of that partnership that we have with ESA and what really our Belgium team is doing and really a shout out uh, Juan to you and to Eric and the entire team. So for Leo, you have about an hour and a half orbital period. What does it shake out for in VLEO, and what sort of options do you get other than latency uh, as opposed to Leo? Yeah, oh, great question, Rick. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. So or orbital period remains actually pretty similar uh, to to about ninety minutes. So a little puts and takes there. But um, uh, what other advantages? I think was the second part of that question. And again, proximity. So, you know, free space loss is a square function. So if you can half the distance between you, it's a 400% increase in performance. Uh, yeah, so Rick, I would also add like, Rick, so if you think of like, uh, what are the advantages of some of the drones we have today? This we're, we're calling our new breed of satellite, right? It's a, a, an orbital drone. You get the ability of persistence. You get the ability of uh, having a persistence over an area. You get the ability of being closer uh, by that, you get the ability to do maybe more affordable, affordable COTS plus payloads, right? That don't need the, the rad hardening and, and the, go through the radiation of higher uh, altitudes. So you get a, a number of advantages from launch to operations to really the type of products that you can actually, the type of payload you can actually fly. Yes. Go ahead, Major. Do you have any updates on the uh, biofabrication facility? Well, I'm sorry, say that again. Do you have any updates on the uh, BFF? BFF. A biofabrication facility. All right. Oh, so Where's for are, are you talking um, our work out of uh, Indiana and the work we're doing? Uh, so I will speak to it, but I'm looking for one of our folks there. Um, I can tell you, uh, if you haven't seen what we're doing with Pillbox and Pfizer, and uh, it's just uh, with Eli Lilly, it's a phenomenal opportunity. We're really proud of that work that we're able to do also with NASA and our colleagues there. With working uh, on only uh, work when you know you think of the astronauts that are going to go to from moon to the Mars, you know having some of that farmer work done, you know you're not going to be able to if you're an astronaut on Mars, right? You're going to have to like have capabilities on you, like whether it be on the prescriptions and pharma side or whether it be on the food side, uh, but also on the medical side. Our, our team out of Jacksonville, for folks who haven't uh, seen of uh, and our folks up in Indiana, have done some amazing research in micro um, uh, gravity. And uh, I would definitely say if you haven't seen it, check it out on the website. Uh, it's amazing uh, the the payloads and the work they're doing, uh, and they have done. And actually, exciting things we're going to be doing this year. Hey, Dean. So, given the fact that you can uh, currently look at satellites as strategic systems that support tactical operations, given that we call it an orbital drone and the modular uh, construction of it, can you talk about what you think it's going to do for tactical responsiveness in space? Oh, great question. So the question was, how is this going to support tactically responsive space? I think amazing. Uh, and it's going to be a very Im really critical and important and foundational, I believe, uh, not only orbit to operate in, but a, a technology. And so, Spence, I'll let you start with that question that we got uh, from the audience. Yeah, I, I always like to think of it kind of like, how does it compare to like UAS? Right now, that's an ISR option that's available. Well, there, there is a world where uh, you may have denied environments. You just can't go over an area for reasons. And uh, this is kind of like the, the next best thing. You're just that slightly higher strategic ground, if you will, where yeah. you can fly uh, over uh, denied areas. Uh, and even if there were to be uh, some sort of issue, again, it's a self-cleaning uh, regime. So you kind of yeah. get